Just a few weeks ago, I interviewed scientist Ivan Galanin, who founded the Adipo skincare company. His work had come to my attention because he replied to a comment on one of my videos from a viewer who was concerned about loss of fat volume in her face after a clinical skin tightening treatment. And he said he believed the fat loss could be restored naturally over time. So I contacted Ivan to find out more and he sent me a research paper and it kind of blew my mind because in it he outlines the various causes of fat loss, some of which I didn't know, and how he believes it can be restored. And it also shared the results of a trial he had run using 3D imaging to show what did seem to be good results for a cream he has developed to support facial fat loss restoration. So I asked him if he would be willing to do an interview with me on the channel about it, and he said yes. The response to that interview took both of us by surprise. I thought people would find what he had to say interesting, but we got so many questions as a result and so many people ordered his cream. So I feel a responsibility to those who ordered the cream as a result of the interview, as I myself did. And I've asked Ivan to come back today so that he can respond to more of your questions and concerns about his research, what it means, and the cream. And also to remind you that I have started to use this cream daily, as has fellow YouTuber Claudia Rolnick from the Claudia Glows channel, who I trust and collaborated with recently. And we will compare our results together at three months to give you an independent view. So watch out for that and subscribe for updates. For now, let's hear what Ivan had to say in response to your questions and comments. So Ivan, <laughs> Welcome again. Um, you told me uh, in the last interview about the research you'd been doing and uh, the cream that you have produced and it attracted a huge amount of interest and a lot of orders. What have you made of the response um, in, the, in those last few weeks? It's impressive. I think that um, I'm, I think it hits it it, I think it hit a nerve, mm -hmm. this idea. I think there was so much new information that we communicated really about the biology. Um, and it's all documented by peer-reviewed science that wasn't familiar to people. So I think that that's really how I explain why the response was so strong. Because we talked about things that people had never heard of before. The fact that the skin has its own fat cells, that they regenerate naturally, that you're not just born with a certain set of fat cells and and you, you won't get any more. No, and also the idea of how lifestyle affects uh, fat in the face. I think all of that was really new. And that was really my intent of going on with you in the first place is there's such a gap of information that if we hadn't even talked about the cream, it would have been incredibly valuable to me mm -hmm. because it's difficult to get all these really big concepts out in the public. And I've loved the debate. Like I love the fact that people have commented and said, no, I, I heard this or I don't believe that. It's yeah. great because everything that we say for the most part, you know, some of it is hypothesis driven. But for the most part, a lot of the things that we talk about are supported by peer reviewed documentation. And so people can go read those papers and then respond and understand where there are gaps and so on. That was really my intent with the interview is to is to spread awareness of the real elements of facial fat fitness. Yeah. The fact that the cream got the fact that the cream got so much attention is actually it's both good and bad because mm -hmm. before we had a really small group of customers. We didn't advertise. And so a lot of our use came from word of mouth. Yeah. And my and my concern is, frankly, that a, a lot of people, especially who just will buy one bottle, they'll use it and they won't see the results they were hoping for. And then they'll say, oh, this doesn't work. Because in our in our clinical studies, we really just measured efficacy after three months. So yeah. that was our that was our first uh, time point. So we measured it three months and six months. And so and we tell people, uh, look, it's not this is not something that's going to be instant. You have to really be consistent. One of the um, one of the commenters suggested that we make available some of the participants from the clinical study. Yeah. And I, th 
I think that's a really good idea. And what I'm going to actually ask you is if you would, I provide you the emails and um, names of the people, you could actually contact them and, and, um, and talk to them without any, without my involvement and, and um, see what they have to say. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I can do, of course, people will come back and say, well, you only picked the ones that were, that had the good results. <laughs> um, ex ex exactly. So in this case, we could do it. So there are 35 subjects. You pick six numbers at random, and then mm -hmm. those are the those are the subjects because all the subjects were numbered in the clinical study. We could give you those subjects, and okay. there, there there were subjects in the study that didn't have uh, great results, and in in okay. those cases, it was really because they didn't need it. They were younger, mm -hmm. and we had a twenty six year old who had perfectly voluminous face. She she got no results, and that why did you have her in the the study to begin with if she's 26 and and didn't need it because <laughs> her because her in her case her mom uh was using it and she was enjoying it and she said you have to you have to um give it to my daughter yeah and um, we were struggling during COVID to get people so we included basically all comers uh so we had the age range was from 26 to 68 mm -hmm. and okay. we had a we had a sprinkling of men we had four men and we didn't really pick people who really needed the cream. We took whoever, basically whoever walked in the door, um, which is which is very different from the way most people do clinical studies. And in fact, it's something that we've gotten pushback from the uh, academic reviewers. Why did you include such a heterogeneous population? And yeah. but the but but we benefited from that because we saw that there was a statistically significant correlation between age and efficacy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. younger people did worse and older people did better. Okay, well, I'm hoping for some regeneration. I did have to laugh at one person commenting, saying that she was pleased to see that somebody like me with lines and jowls was testing this. <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah. I Thank you, I think. Okay, I, I want to really get into the questions that came from our viewers. That was That's what this follow-up is all about, just, just filling in some of the blanks for them and, and responding as well to some of the concerns. So um, something that I was just such a miss from me when I watched our interview back, I was like, why on earth did I not follow up on that? Because you explained that your research suggests that some traditional moisturizers actually bloat our fat cells and therefore you said they prevent the fat from being naturally restored. Okay, you mentioned that you had used a, a cottonseed oil-based moisturizer that had helped a skin complaint, but when you looked at uh, its, its effect on the skin, that was when you began to realize that that was bloating fat cells. And you went on from there, you said, to develop something that helped to restore the fat that had been lost in those cells. So first of all, why is bloating of our fat cells a problem if they are bloated? Does that not do the job? And what are the ingredients that we need to watch out for that bloat fat cells? Right. So I'll put a link to a paper from Shiseido on the on the channel so people can read it for themselves. Okay. But Shiseido is actually a pioneer in this field. And they've shown indisputably that when the fat cells get really big, um, they actually stop secreting the factors that um, support the skin's fibroblasts. And it's a very it's a very elegant paper. And they've also done a clinical corollary where they actually took biopsies and they showed this correlation of fat cell size with sagging in the skin. Are there specific ingredients that do that? Is I mean, because because where people are left with that is they're going right. Well, I mean, I use moisturizer every day. Um, how do I know if it's doing that? Well, it's it's unlikely to be. It's unlikely that the moisturizer is causing the fat cells to bloat. Unlikely. And this is why, because typically people are rubbing the moisturizer into the skin, right? They're not, remember when our instructions are to leave the cream on the surface of the skin so that it can actually 
uh, travel down the hair follicle. But that's not typical instruction for a moisturizer. Moisturizer, you put it on, you rub it in. The moisturizer gets stuck in the epidermis where, where, where it needs to be, where people want it to be moisturizing the epidermis. And it never gets a chance to travel down the hair follicle. So that's why I'm not certain that actually um, oil-based moisturizers will actually have this effect. But again, this is, this is just a hypothesis. Right. So, but the cottonseed moisturizer that you were using did. Look yes, because, because I was leaving it on the skin. I wasn't rubbing it in. Okay, that is a really important distinction for people to understand, isn't it? Because that was certainly after I watched it back, I thought, oh my goodness, the big hole in this is that people are using moisturizers every day that could be preventing um, fat, fat renewal. So um, I'm glad that we cleared that up. Um. Okay, so um, there has been confusion then over that formulation and a little bit of criticism in some quarters around because I think I think there was possibly uh, some people thought that you'd taken that cottonseed oil formula and uh, basically done something with it to create your own formula. How, how, how did the two, I think probably in the way the interview came across, that we didn't quite connect the dots there. Your research on that cottonseed oil-based formula and where you have got to today and how they differ. So they differ in two uh, key respects. One is that instead of cottonseed oil, we're using safflower seed oil, which is less comedogenic. But really the big innovation was to add the Camphoria parviflora extract, and that's the black ginger. And so the black ginger we found was balancing the lipogenesis of the um, of of the safflower seed oil, and it was keeping it in check. And so that's really well described in our in our patent application. And so I'll also provide a link to that patent application so people can actually read the whole story. Okay. So and your um, formula does not use cottonseed oil. It's not present. So the difference then between restoring facial fat and fat cell renewal, another thing that has come up, because the accepted view is that you cannot grow new fat cells, correct? Yes, and this is, uh, this is completely uh, untrue. Um, so the, the only question that exists is how quickly fat cells regenerate how much turnover there is. And there's a great deal of uh, variability in the estimates. They range from 5% per year to 100% per year. So, um, but they absolutely do, do regenerate. And um, in fact, it, the, the science, I, I'll also link a really great study from mm -hmm. like one of the top um, academic groups in the country that studied defective adipogenesis during aging. So it's insufficient adipogenesis and not on the face. This is whole body adipogenesis. Adipogenesis, what's that? That's new fat cell formation. That's regeneration. Okay, because okay. I've seen a lot of doctors saying you can't, you know, you can't grow new fat cells. Well, I think that a lot of the doctors who say that are also performing liposuction and other you know, cool sculpting procedures that removes the fat cells. And so they say, well, it, it won't grow back. Because, well, that's a big problem, you know, freezing fat cells um, and, and, and destroying fat cells that, you know, people are told, and, and particularly where we've, we've seen very publicly cases where that's gone wrong. And um, we're told those fat cells don't come back, but, but you are saying that you, you think they could. Absolutely. So the, the, the case with Linda Evangelista yeah. is the case you're referring to. She had what's called paradoxical adip adipocyte hyperplasia, where the, or PAH, um, 
which is when when you remove the fat and the regeneration is so tremendous that you get a remarkable adipogenic response. And so you have a lot of really small fat cells. And so the 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 structure of the tissue is actually much different than the surrounding tissue. It's harder, it's firmer, it's different. And that is, I guess, the clearest evidence that that anyone needs to needs to needs to see that you do have this tremendous adipogenic response in the body. That I mean that's an outlier. That's a you know that that's adipogenesis gone wrong. Um, yeah. But there's also the normal regular adipogenesis that happens all the time. Okay. Um so going back to the cream, a lot of people thought that it would be impossible for a cream to reach the depth in the skin, um, to reach the fat cells, basically. So how does it do that in your in your view? So it's, it was it was funny. One one of the comments actually, I think, echoed word for word something that Madonna's dermatologist said about the cream in a Birdie article. She says it's impossible to stimulate fat cell regeneration because it can't reach the fat cells. Mm -hmm. I think that was word word for word, and that's actually been disproven, uh, not just by us, but by the a really um, great skincare company called Elastin. Mm -hmm. And so Elastin is famous for their mm -hmm. peptide products. And so they developed a peptide that would um, uh, help clear uh, fat and, and the debris of fat cells that were released during cryolipolysis or fat cell destruction. Mm -hmm. And they, they've published four papers that we'll, we'll provide the links to. And one, the first paper is actually a mechanistic paper. They describe, you know, how uh, topical compositions reach the fat cells. And then the other three publications are actual clinical publications where they show their results. And their results are, are so clear cut positive that it's, it's, it's indisputable. You know, you, 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 you can, you can do it. Um, so you, you're saying that the cream slides down the hair follicles and reaches the fat cells around those follicles. Correct. Again, theoretically, I haven't done any biopsies. And I mean, the, the work to, to actually show that proof is mm -hmm. You have to radio label the, the 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 creams ingredients, which I don't even know if we could do it because they're natural um, extracts, and you have to show that there's like a binding, you know, a, a location of these of these ingredients. It's beyond the the ability of a small company. But if you look at the Elastin work, it's very clear cut, and they're really they're 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 great uh, scientists. They've published super extensively. So don't trust me, trust them. Okay. Um, now, the other thing that attracted a lot of attention uh, was when you talked about dynamic facial movement, like singing, causing fat loss. And, and you mentioned Mick Jagger and Harry Styles, and, and you said it was called rock star face. And then we had people saying, well, what about JLo? You know, she doesn't have to, significant fat loss and presumably she sings a lot. I mean, why? <laughs> Why the difference, do you think? Yeah, so I, I, I clearly went out on a limb there and <laughs> uh, talked about something that, you know, I only had anecdotal evidence for. And um, I've actually um, commented back on some of the commentators who said, you know, who, who questioned me about this. And, mm -hmm. I've, and they've said, do you have clinical evidence that this is going on? And, and I clearly don't, right? In mm -hmm. fact, this was just a hypothesis that was formed that looking at people like Mick Jagger, like Steven Tyler, like Harry Styles, and wondering like, how is it possible that these uh, that these these singers have such uh, relative uh, loss around the mouth? And one person actually commented. She said, "Well, it must must have something to do with the size of the mouth." Mm -hmm. And you know, it could. I mean, this is. This is a topic that has not been researched at all. We have so, no one. 
Well, what has been researched as in facial fat loss relating to exercise? Because people are also saying, well, what does that mean I can't do my facial yoga? You know, what does that mean? What is proven around yeah. exercise so, and fat loss? So unfortunately, the, the best study of facial exercises was done by a group from Chicago, um, Northwestern, Dr. Alam in 2018. We'll provide a link to that paper as well. And he showed that the facial exercises build volume in the mid, middle, mid face. So they looked at upper, mid, and lower part of the face. The mid face was the only area where they got statistically significant results. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not working in other places, but it means that we only saw results in the, in the, in, that were statistically significant in the mid face. So, and that's the only, that's to my understanding, the only really good study of the efficacy of facial exercises. And so um, that, that, that's the, unfortunately, Claire, that's the state of the industry. We don't have a tremendous amount of data and we're left uh, piecing things together. So separate from the idea that forces, dynamic forces affect adipogenesis, there's also the clear cut evidence that high intensity exercise uh, also slows down adipogenesis. Mm -hmm. And we can provide the links to those papers as well. So, and, and this has been shown, you know, in, in, in humans running half marathons in animals subjected to water maze tests. It's, you know, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty clear. Okay. So um, high impact uh, would include what do you think? Just because people will come back and go, so what exercise if I wanted to protect the facial fat that I have on my face, um, but obviously want to keep in shape? What's the where? Where's the balance? What balance am I trying to achieve? That's a that's a great question <laughs> that no one no one has no one has studied this, and so we actually looked into this. Like, okay, if we're telling people that they should exercise, what is a uh, grounded evidence that we can give them and it was really hard to 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 figure out and and to uh project from the animal studies to humans so so what we say is you know try to exercise in moderation and then if you if that's not your if that's not your thing if you really get pleasure from high intensity exercise then try to do something anti-inflammatory either um either sauna or cold or something that will subdue the um infl the the acute inflammatory response just coming back to the cream because i have had a few questions about how to use it as part of your skin care i use tretinoin every day um i know a lot of people do so they're asking can they use the cream um with a uh, retinol or retinoid what what do you what's the order that you should use that in if you're doing that so i i i have been suggesting that people use their retin a or retinol mm -hmm. and then they, they they rub that into the skin and then to put the to put the cream on top um cuz that way the, the retin A gets into the um, epidermis where it, where it's mediating its effect, and then our cream can has access to the hair follicle and can uh, get down the hair follicle. Okay, um, so that's that was what I was wondering whether that was going to kind of block it. Um, any idea with a hyaluronic acid serum, for instance, or something like that? Um, is that going to cause any issues? The, the one thing that I've been moving away from is hyaluronic acid. Mm -hmm. And there's clear evidence that hyaluronic acid can penetrate deeply into the skin and, in fact, can destabilize the stratum corneum um, through over-moisturizing. So it, it's such an effective molecule. It draws in so much moisture that there's a suggestion that it could be creating cracks in the stratum corneum um, that um, are 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 not beneficial to the skin. So, I mean, that's a whole. We could do a whole <laughs> You've just thrown in a grenade. <laughs> no, we 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 could do a whole episode oh on, on on hyaluronic acid. Um, I've done I've I've and there's a woman Mary Shook who actually clued me in on this, and 
And I thought, you know, it was like overstated. But then when I started looking uh, closely at the mechanism, I believe it definitely okay. could destable. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, honestly, I think probably of everything I learn from all the different people I speak to on this channel is that, you know, there is just so much research and so many different hypotheses or whatever. Hypotheses? Hypotheses? Hypo hypotheses. <laughs> um, and it's really difficult for consumers to try and work out what on earth to do for the best. I mean, you take advice, oh, hyaluronic acid, that's the thing, or vitamin C or whatever it is, and you use it in good faith, and then it's like, okay, well, maybe that's not such a good thing. It's, it's really quite tough for consumers to know what a good skincare routine looks like in, the, in this day and age. It, it is because, because you don't have any unbiased perspectives. Mm. Yeah. So, so you, you don't, and there's no national Institute of skincare that's being funded by the government to do research. So that's yeah. why there's so many areas of, of that we've talked about where it's really unresearched. Um, okay. Well, what I will promise people is I will go and I will try and find an expert. I will try and bring another view on that, on um, the evidence behind hyaluronic acid and uh, maybe get a few voices in the mix there to see what we can we can come up with some, with some different advice around that. Just I think my, my goal at the moment is really to bring a range of voices, expertise, opinions and help people try to learn more about skincare and understand it better. Um, Okay, so we've only got a couple of minutes. Let me just get into some another couple of specifics around um, fat renewal. With the cream, um, people are asking, can they use it on their necks? Can they put, use it on the back of their hands? Can they use it elsewhere in the body? No, uh, we, we, we've had people using on their necks and their hands with good results, okay. um, but no evidence for the rest of the body. Uh, and also... No evidence uh, for temples. We, we we really don't have any any evidence for that. Okay, because I would love to, you know, I have I am applying up here and that would be a total result for me, but I, I can understand there's probably not many there probably wouldn't be too many fat cells in your in your temples, are there? Well, you have the dermal fat, um, but I I'm not sure to what extent you have a subcutaneous, how much subcutaneous fat you have there. All right. Well, I think I think we're there, Ivan. Thank you very much. You know, I think that's just provided another layer of people uh, of information for people who really had a lot of questions after this. That hopefully um, that that kind of makes a difference and helps clear a few things up. And um, I will, of course, be back in in a few months' time after I've used the cream um, to to share my results as well. So um, yeah, I'll I'll use it every day faithfully for three months and see where I get to. And one more thing is mm -hmm. if there are people in the New York area that are or that want to um, go through the same testing that we did in the in the clinical study, we'd be happy to do that. We'd be delighted. So they can they can contact us. We can set up an appointment for them to go to the plastic surgery office where we do the testing and they can be tested at at baseline at three months at six months and we can chart their progression as well. That would be good, actually. So what might be nice is if some uh, viewers make themselves uh, who live in the New York area, maybe make themselves known to me as well. So I can kind of independently verify we can all see that they came through the com. I mean, it, it's all open, I guess. Yeah, if people are being skeptical, as they should, they should be. It's all open to, you know. Yeah. Um, be tampered with but let's just let's just do that and ask some people who have bought the cream or watching this interview back and live in the New York area and would like to actually have that measured through a 3D scan is it that's right to, to let us know in the comments um, and then I can I can refer them to you thank you so much Claire really enjoyed thank it thank you thanks Ivan cheers okay.